Okay, so um, I'm going to do the tutorial MFH3, which you can find um, in the new, uh, oops, sorry, in this folder here, in, sorry, in the version two, because it's, yeah, I did some late correction, so you should uh, use that, um, that um, script. Um, so there you will find the uh, Jupyter Python script and then um, an input to TV Trans that I prepared that we will look at um, later. So this exercise tries to reproduce this paper where the author takes two systems, um, an armchair nano ribbon and a zigzag nano ribbon and perform, I think, siesta calculations and uh, tight bending calculations and compare with different sets of parameters. Uh, and also they do um, calculations with the mean field Howard Hamiltonian. So the same as uh, we, are, we are going to do here. And they take uh, different, they try different parameters, for instance, first nearest neighbors, uh, up to third nearest neighbors, non-orthogonal basis, orthogonal basis, and then com they compare the bunch structures that they find, and also including and not including um, electron interactions. Um, and they compare um, the bunch structures obtained with siesta and these uh, tight binding models. Here in this table, you can find the different sets of parameters that correspond to each calculation that they show in figure two. So the idea here is that we are going to try to reproduce this spin polarization for this nanoconstriction here for the zigzag uh, for the zigzag structure, and then we are trying to um, find this uh, spin uh, transport uh, transmission probabilities. Okay, this is nice because they compare the mean field Howard calculations with uh, calculations performed in siesta. So it's like killing two birds with one shot. <laughs> okay, so let's open. If you cannot hear me well, or if you cannot see my screen, please uh, let me know. Everything is good, no worries. Thank you. Okay, so here, well, here is the introduction of, the, of what I just said. We are going to try to reproduce this paper here. Uh, using this particular uh, class of the Havar package. So let's start. Okay, here I um, set the common parameters that are going to be common for all the calculations that are uh, being performed in this, in this notebook. So we are going to use this. Uh, Oops. Uh, the set B. So we are going to use the third nearest neighbors model with an orthogonal, ba uh, an orthogonal basis and uh, the Coulomb repulsion parameter set to two electron volts. This is the hopping parameter between first, second, and third ne uh, nearest neighbors. Okay, so I will execute this cell. So common parameters for uh, all the systems on site current revolution set to two, and the temperature of all systems is going to be uh, 25 milli electron volts because uh, in our NEGF class, we perform the integration of the Green's function to obtain the density matrix using a transiesta, I mean, an energy contour that was extracted from a transiesta calculation, uh, which was performed at a temperature of uh, 25 uh, milli EV. So, we have to use that temperature. But you can use another contour of, uh, uh, if you want, and you can pass it to the NEGF class and then you can use another temperature. But for this case, we're going to use the, this temperature. Um, okay, so now we have to compute the electrodes first. So we build the, um, the geometry of the unit cell here, which is going to be a zigzag graph and an ribbon of with pi. Then we build the tight binding Hamiltonian of the of that structure by using the parameters I just told you. So first nearest neighbors 2.7 uh, electron volts. Uh, the hopping between second nearest neighbors is going to be 0.2. 
and the hopping parameter between certain years neighbors is 0.18 following the, the table of the paper. This is a function that we have implemented in the Hover package, but you can build the dynamic Hamiltonian using CISL and setting the, um, um, the, um, the hopping parameters and matrix elements for the Hamiltonian manually uh, as you want. Uh, we build this because it's handy for us because we usually use these kind of structures and we usually have the same Hamiltonian for most of them. So it was uh, okay for us. Uh, and of course the dimension, I did not hear, but the dimension of the Hamiltonian by default is two uh, because we want to spin polarize Hamiltonian. This is necessary for uh, to build the Hauer Hamiltonian object. Then we start building the Hauer Hamiltonian for the electrodes, which are periodic structures along the x direction. So we have to pass here the number of k points in which the Hamiltonian needs to be sampled. So we only have to change the number of k points along the x direction because that's the only period di the periodic direction. Um, and then uh, we use uh, the on-site current report some parameter that is defined in this cell and the temperature of the system, which is also defined in this cell. Then we initialize the spin densities uh, for this structure. I added here a possible uh, spin densities distribution to start the convergence process. Uh, you may want to use another one, but this works okay because we know that this structure hosts localized magnetic moments at the edges of the of the structure. So at the edges of the zigzag ribbon, so the zigzag edges. Um, so um, you are going to see now the structure, but I mean, that's one atom in the unit cell. It's one atom, the first one, and then the other one. So we are placing uh, one up electron in the um, um, in the bottom uh, edge and one down electron in the upper edge. So that's the initial polarization that we are uh, using to start the convergence process. Now we can converge and then we have to pass. I think somebody has its mic on. Yeah, Thanks. Um, okay, so I was saying that now we can call the method converge to uh, find the self consistent solution for the Hamiltonian, or the mean field power Hamiltonian. So to do that, we have to pass a function that tells uh, the code how the spin densities are going to be found, as I was telling in my talk. Uh, in this case, uh, we can use this function, uh, which uh, uh, works for uh, periodic systems. And then we can say uh, we are going to um, uh, convert, uh, we are going to iterate the Hamiltonian up to a desired tolerance. We want to see what happens during the convergence process. Otherwise, it doesn't print anything, but I think it's nice to see, nice to see the what, what it's doing. And then we can uh, run. OK, so it says that it is going to converge the Hamiltonian towards the tolerance that we set. Uh, and it found a solution in 13 iterations, so pretty fast. Then we can plot the polarization of the unit cell by using this uh, function that we uh, have in the plot class of the Hauer package. So it takes the Hauer Hamiltonian, and uh, since now it's converted, the Hamiltonian is converted. Now the Hamiltonian, uh, uh, the Hauer package has stored the mean field Hauer Hamiltonian for this uh, structure already converted. And as you can see, this is the unit cell. And I, I was saying before, so this spin polarization, what we did is to uh, place an up uh, spin here and, and down spin here, and then we started the, the, the calculation. But this is a, an initial polarization that, okay, we know if for this case that it is going to work because we know, uh, we have an intuition of where the, how the spin polarization of this structure is. 
Okay, so now we can go uh, through the calculations uh, regarding the uh, scattering center, the device region. So we start by building the type binding Hamiltonian. So in this case, um, we are going to do this structure here. So it's like uh, the way I did to uh, reproduce this structure is to re repeat the um, the six star graphene and everyone unit cell and then remove a certain atoms in the middle. Okay, so basically that's it. I took the Hamiltonian. I used this uh, function tile from CITL to repeat it 16 times along the period di uh, direction. And then I just use uh, the function remove to uh, remove uh, these atoms in the middle. And, um, and then I make it finite because it's not very big. And then uh, I also write the, the geometry in the folder, which after executing this cell, you should find this file in your folder. So uh, you can visualize it with XPrize then or whatever you want. Then we have to, then we can start with the mean field power calculations for the open uh, system. So once we have built the geometry for the device and the type binding Hamiltonian, we can start defining the Howard Hamiltonian for that uh, geometry. So we have to pass the type binding Hamiltonian for the central region, the onset Coulomb repulsion parameter and the temperature of the system, which uh, we are using the same values as uh, we define in the first cell of the Jupyter notebook. Then we have also to initialize the spin densities. Uh, and here I am placing um, um, uh, up spins in the lower edge as uh, in the case for the uh, periodic zigzag graph and ribbon for the electrodes. Um, so I'm placing up spins in the lower edge and uh, down spins in the upper edge. So that's my initial spin polarization. So what I do here is to look for the atoms that I like at the edges, which are the atoms um, in the minimum and maximum Y component of the geometry. Um, then I define where the electrodes I are localized in the device. So in this case are the first and last blocks of the geometry. So that's why I use this atomic indices. So the first uh, atoms um, up to the length of the electrode and then the same, but uh, starting from the last one. Then we have to build the NEGF object, which will allow us to, um, to use the uh, methods in this class uh, that involve the calculation of the Green's function of the device and uh, which will allow us to obtain the spin densities from the Green's function of the device. Uh, to do that, we have to only pass the Howard Hamiltonian object of the device, then a list of the present electrodes that are in our system. In this case, we have two electrodes, one that grows towards uh, the minus semi-infinite direction in the x-axis, in the first axis. So, and the other one grows in the opposite direction. Uh, but the Hamiltonian um, um, the electrode is the same, so we can pass the same uh, how, uh, the same mean field Howard Hamiltonian in each case. And then we say where are the, uh, the electrodes map in the device. And then we just can call the converge function by passing now instead of the previous function. Uh, we have to pass the specific function that tells the code that now the spin densities are going to be found from the Green's function of the device. Um, and then the same things as before. Here, the, this only thing is just that we want to print the information in each step. And now we can execute this cell. So this uh, convergence process takes a little more time than the other ones because it's, it's, uh, it involves the inversion of a dense matrix. It's taking quite a long time.
two let's see here i mean it takes a little more time than the other ones because it has to inverse the matrix but i don't know let's think it's over so long i'm going to rerun again everything Oh, okay. Okay, so it's found the solution in nine iterations. And as you can see, it takes a little more time because as I said, it has, it has to embrace the, the dense matrix of the system. So it's, and in the other cases, for instance, we use uh, the sparse matrices and the advantages of having a sparse matrices. And so that's why the, in the other cases it's pretty fast, but still, I mean, I think in, in less than one minute, you can still find the solution for the device. Um, then we can plot, for instance, the spin polarization of this device that it just found. Um, we can compare and again, they used uh, opposite colors for spin up and spin down than I used, but I, the important thing is that you see that there is a high spin polarization at the borders of the ribbon, and especially at the zigzag uh, borders of the ribbon, and then low spin polarization in the other atoms. And that's exactly what we also get. Strong polarization at the zigzag edges and low polarization uh, in the rest of the atoms. Okay, so now comes the part that you should try yourself. The other part is just was just basically done uh, for you. But um, so the idea here is to um, obtain the transport as uh, being transport calculation for, for this device. Um, so, so, well, I just added the, the cells here, but I mean, this is just copying here. I left some instruction of how one should do this. So first of all, we have to uh, shift everything with uh, its particular Fermi level to have everything aligned because otherwise, if you don't do this, it, it will be equivalent to having some uh, difference uh, time applied like a potential in the system. So that's what, not what we want to, to have because we want to, to do an equilibrium calculation. So we have to sh uh, shift both the electrodes and the device with uh, its uh, the, the electrodes with the Fermi level that we can obtain. This is a function from CISO, of course. And um, with the potential that is found in the NEGF class. So let's do that. And then we have to write the inputs uh, for the TV trans calculation. So we can go to the FDF file that I prepared. So I named the name uh, of the devices Hamiltonian as MFH uh, HC. Dot, um, um, yeah, this is an uh, net CDF um, format. And then the electrodes, I named it uh, like this. So we should say the Hubbard Hamiltonians with these names. Uh, otherwise, you just can. Uh, of course, modify this input file or use an input file that you want, but this is uh, an option. 
Okay, so following that, we save the mean field Howard Hamiltonian uh, with that name uh, for the electrodes with this name, according to what I wrote in the input run FDF Hamilton um, file. And then the same with the device region. Okay, so now we should see these two input files in a CDF uh, format. Now, well, I just left this, uh, but you can run this from your terminal. Of course, I think it's was easier to have everything in the Jupyter notebook. This is just to ensure that we don't have any previous uh, outputs for from our previous uh, TV trans calculation. And then we can use this, which will um, speed up the calculation for this case, at least as we saw in this workshop. And then call TV trans and save the output in this uh, file. Really fast calculation. So now we should have everything. Yes, exactly. Um, and then we can use CISO to extract the, um, the outputs. So in this case, since we have a spin polarized Hamiltonian, uh, TB trans realize that and do, uh, and so what it does is two different calculations. What one for the first spin, uh, spin index and one for the second spin index, index. And it will store the output in uh, in these two different files, different uh, name up and down. So we can read uh, the output um, from TV trans using CISO, and then we can plot, and we have the uh, transmission for each spin channel. Then we can go. to a reference paper and check. Okay, so we are comparing, in this case, uh, the top panels belong to a mean field power calculation and the lower panels belong to a transiesta calculation. And this, right, this B panel belongs to a spin up and this uh, C panel belongs to spin down. So we can compare directly this blue curve uh, to this one. So, and as you can see, I think it's really clear that it's very, very similar. I mean, just comparing by the eye, of course, but, um, and the same um, with uh, the down uh, spin component here. And it's nice this example because you also can compare with a transiesta calculation as, and as you can see, it's also very, very similar. So I think uh, this model, if you use a correct identity parameterization, you can reproduce pretty much uh, um, another calculation obtained with a more accurate method such as transiesta, but you can do it in one minute calculation and have everything in, in one file and obtain it locally in your machine pretty, pretty fast. So I think that's pretty handy. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> this is my code, so <laughs> it's normal that I think like that. <laughs> so I think that uh, this is the end of this tutorial. I it took much, much less time than other ones. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. Doesn't look like. Okay. Okay, I hear I have some of them. Ah, here, uh, Elabet Haidar asked, uh, sorry, I might have missed this, but I was wondering if the U value was chosen randomly. Yeah, so this is an, a question that came up uh, the other day of uh, um, during my talk. And the U value is not chosen randomly. It's it's really hard to give an explanation of how one should use uh, to should choose the the U value. But I think for starters, uh, the U value shouldn't uh, surpass too much the value of the hopping parameters because otherwise you should be in the uh, strong correlation regime. So that's something to take into account. Um, so. For instance, what we usually use 
for our uh, graphene based structures is a uh, U value that is in the range of the hopping parameter, so around 3 EV, uh, more or less. But the U value, I mean, uh, it will change your, uh, your results quantitatively, of course, but qualitatively, uh, you will find similar results using a U that is within a range. So I, what we do usually is to use these models to explain, for instance, uh, some experiments and so on. So we try to adapt our U um, to try to reproduce our um, the, the experimental results. And then it's more like kind of the kind of up, uh, in backwards, I mean, uh, it's like, what is the you that you need to reproduce such experiments? I mean, it's like how to explain, uh, so how, how intense are the Coulomb interaction in the system to reproduce that experimental system? More like that. And also, I mean, this U value may vary a lot for the same geometry. Um, even for the same geometry, if you place the geometry on one surface or another in an experiment, because the screening effect is going to be different on one surface and on another. So it's, it's kind of hard. So it may even uh, change for the same geometry. Uh, ah, so thanks, guys. I know you answered my, my question also. Uh, is that value only found in papers? You can actually, what we usually do also is to compare, maybe uh, uh, we do um, calculations with siesta um, or, or another method, of course, uh, with density functional theory, let's say. And then um, we imagine that you have a large system that you want to um, a model with the mean field power Hamiltonian. And then what you can maybe do is to model a smaller structure with siesta, maybe try to see how it compares to mean field power uh, calculation, and then use those parameters to uh, model a larger structure and then uh, see what happens there. But I think that the strong point of the Howard Hamiltonian is kind of a toy model that allows us to play really easily with the parameters and how to see what is the role of each part of the Hamiltonian, so the kinetic part and the interaction part, to actually understand a lot of things of your system. So I would say that that's the strong part of the Howard Hamiltonian. Maybe not to give a really quantitative result about that, much is more like to a qualitative understanding of the system. And that's, I think that's really nice. It's like, a, it's like a, the accuracy you would get from a tight binding calculation. It's like, if I change this hopping parameter, then what happens to my system? Also, more or less like that. Uh, Shamik asks, in your work, you achieve magnetic nature of graphene nanoribbons? Yes, exactly. That's exactly what we do here. <laughs> I mean, having localized magnetic moments, like having localized spins in your molecule uh, give rise to uh, magnetic features in your structures. And actually, for instance, in one of uh, the papers that we published, um, uh, they observed a condo effect in actually in two of the papers that we published, they, uh, the experimentalists observed condo effect in, the, in two different molecules, in two graphene molecules. So, uh, that's a proof of that uh, magnetism, can, magnetism can be induced in graphene. So, uh, Elabet Haidar asks, so you play around the value of U to get closer to experimental results? Yes, exactly. We typically do that. If so, which results uh, do you usually explore? Results of what, of experiments or results of our, the U values that we explore. Um, I mean, we, we typically uh, work with experimentalists that uh, perform nice uh, experiments. And then we try to give an explanation of how we can find uh, such results, such experimental results. Um, 
with our system. So that's how we can how we uh, play with the U value. Um, yeah, and as I said, the U value that we typically use is around uh, the value of the hopping parameter. I think you can start from that. Can Gondo be modeled uh, by mean field Howard Hamiltonian? No, the Gondo effect is a many body effect that cannot be modeled with a mean field Howard model because the mean field Howard model is actually, um, it's an approximation and actually it's a single particle model. So um, no. <laughs> But you can, what we did actually is to explain uh, why the condo effect uh, um, was present in that molecule because of the presence of localized magnetic moments, which we could actually predict theoretically with this model. Not to um, demonstrate that our molecule uh, was uh, having the uh, condo effect, but it's like why the condo effect uh, is present because uh, there are localized magnetic moments in the molecule, and we demonstrated that with using the mean field Howard Hamiltonian and also uh, density functional uh, calculations. Yeah, Thomas says that one can also choose a U value to come close to results from a TFT calculation. Yes, that's uh, exactly. Yeah, you can, you, you should compare. Uh, to a more accurate uh, <laughs> uh, description, yeah. But I think what is nice of this model is that typically, if you if you use the correct parameters, then you can typically find similar results as what you can get with with density functional theory, as as proven here, for instance. I that I think that's a, a strong point. Well, I think there are no more further questions. Mm. I don't know, maybe we should move to um, to the next uh, tutorial. Which TFT calculation would you suggest to do such comparison? One on one side, you should do spin polarized calculation because we are comparing a spin polarized calculation with the mean field power Hamiltonian. So that's one thing. And I, we typically use siesta, but other um, other methods can give similar results, like BASP. I guess I I haven't tried by BASP myself, um, but. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's exactly your question. If not, please answer again, uh, ask again. Should we move to the next 